Did you see the front page of the Free Press on Tuesday, an article about Colin Cunningham from Richland, Michigan? You see, Colin has a sensory processing disorder similar to Asperger's syndrome. So some people saw him as being too different, too quirky, too, mu too much unlike them to relate to, someone perhaps to bully, or at least someone to exclude. And as Colin's 11th birthday drew near, he told his parents that he did not want a birthday party this year because he didn't have any friends. He eats lunch at school pretty much alone in the, church off or in the, church, the school office every day, and though recently he said one other boy had joined him. Now, I'm sure this was really, really distressing for his parents to hear, but Colin's mother decided to take action, so she set up a Happy Birthday Colin Facebook page. She was hoping to get a few likes, maybe a few birthday wishes for her son, but the result was truly amazing. Over 2.1 million likes, 78,000 letters and packages for Colin from, sent from all around the world, an appearance in New York City on Good Morning America, and a family trip to Disney World for a week-long celebration of his birthday. Colin said, this is really big. When he came back from Disney World and they took him to the two storage units and opened the doors so he could see all the things that had been sent to him. So he plans to donate many of his gifts to others because he really loves helping people. And you see, in a real sense, Colin's happy birthday letters and gifts are for all children, for all people who are excluded or bullied. Now, I don't know if Colin's mom is a Christian or not, but she is following the Jesus way, helping her outsider son to move to the inside. And in the process, she has heard from so many parents and teachers and scout leaders and coaches, all kinds of people who interact with children day after day, who are using this experience to talk with their children about the hurt that comes when someone is excluded and you leave someone out, and how to include other people, especially people who seem different. And the other adults who received this wake-up call as they watched all of this happen, are now talking to their children about including others day to day at school, at church, at synagogue, at the mosque, in their sports teams, everywhere they are. These people also are starting to follow the Jesus way and they're teaching children to do the same. You see, Jesus was all about going to those on the outside, welcoming those outsiders into his inner circle of healing love. Henry just read to us about the miracle of the leper healed by Jesus, but perhaps the real miracle is not the healing itself. The real miracle actually could be the fact that it is a leper in Matthew's gospel to whom Jesus first goes, to whom he first reaches out in healing love to bring hope. Leprosy is a horrible disease, and people suffer greatly from skin lesions, damage to sensory nerves, destroyed body parts, infections, loss of body parts, all eventually leading to their death. The disease is spread by touch, and it is highly contagious. In Jesus' day, there were no cures and nothing that could be done to hold the disease at bay for a while. If by chance another person approached, lepers were required by Levitical law to cover their mouths and to call out, unclean, unclean. Most likely, this was an attempt to, at health control, an attempt to not spread the diseases, an attempt to not let the leprosy go from person to person, not too much unlike our modern quarantine practices. At some point, though, this physical quarantine became a moral judgment on the person. In Jesus' day, it was quite clear lepers were society's despised outcasts, driven from their homes, forced to live alone outside the city, perhaps in the wilderness, or if they were really lucky, they might be able to live with a group of others with a disease in some far out-of-the-way place avoided by other people, truly outcasts of society. Now, can you imagine if you had to cover your mouth and yell, unclean, unclean, Every time someone came near you, how long would it take for your spirit to be broken 
and your self-image destroyed? Can you imagine what it would be like to be labeled unclean to all the world? How long, how long do you think it might take before you would consider yourself really different, terribly inferior, unworthy of love, unworthy of companionship, someone to be neither seen nor heard nor touched? In Matthew, this leper is the first one to be welcomed into Jesus' circle of healing love. Then there's the Roman centurion. He seems to be at least somewhat in the inner circle, in his work life anyway. This professional soldier seems to be a person with some degree of power. He has soldiers and attendants under his command. He tells them to go, and they go. He tells them to come, and they come. He tells them to do something, do this or that, and they do it. But there are some things he cannot command, some things he is not able to control, some things and circumstance over, over which he has no power. And there is something compelling about Jesus, something powerful, something about Jesus that makes a centurion believe, something about Jesus that makes this Roman centurion humbly come to Jesus, a Jewish teacher, seeking help. Something about Jesus that makes him come to Jesus in hope, in hope that Jesus can help one of his young charges who lies in bed paralyzed and in great pain. And the centurion cannot fix the situation. This centurion, remember, represents the Roman Empire, an empire occupying Jesus' country, dominating his people, a true outsider who has intruded into the Jewish community. And Jesus responds to the centurion's need, going to the centurion's home, walking right into enemy territory, a member of the crushing, dominating empire. And this member of the crushing, dominating empire is allowed into the circle of Jesus' healing love, along with his young attendant, who lies helpless in great need. Jesus crosses a boundary, builds a bridge, extends a healing hand, and forms a friendship and relationship with someone on the outside, welcoming them to join him at the center of the circle. What about Peter's mother-in-law? Was she an insider or an outsider? Since Peter was one of the first disciples, and she was a member of his family, seems like she would be an insider, right? But was she really? She seems to be a regular part of Peter's and his wife's household, making her own contributions to the household chores. Because we read when the fever is gone and she's feeling better, she gets up and goes about her work, in this case, serving Jesus. So with this little bit of information, we can make a few reasonable assumptions. Peter's mother-in-law has at least one child, Peter's wife. So probably she was married at some point, and her husband must be dead. Otherwise, we would expect that she would be living with her husband. Her husband must not have had any living brothers eligible for marriage at this time, or she likely would have been given to one of them as a wife, since that was the custom of the Jewish community of the day. Old enough to have at least one daughter, who was old enough to be married and running a household, Peter's mother-in-law probably is old by the standards of the day when the life expectancy for males was 25 years and perhaps a little bit more for women. And now she is sick, burning up with a fever. Back then, sickness might be seen as God's judgment on a person, illness rightly deserved for the evil ways of your life or evidence of being possessed by a demon or an evil spirit, someone to be shunned, someone to judge harshly. So maybe Peter's mother-in-law is an outsider after all. She's a woman, which already makes her second class in her society. She is a widow with no real rights, no one to provide for her, no acceptable way of making a living for herself. She is probably old, at least old enough, that many would push her to the outside of the circle of influence to be ignored the rest of her days. And she is ill, causing some to avoid her and to wonder what awful thing she has done in her life. An older, sick, widow woman 
living with her daughter and son-in-law so that Peter will provide for her as part of his own family. And Jesus touches her life with healing love, drawing her into his inner circle. Now notice in these stories, Jesus does not push those in the inner circle to the outside. When Je what Jesus is doing is inviting more and more to come to the inside of the circle. He's pushing the borders of the circle so that it's wider and wider, further and further out, making it bigger so there will be room for all. He isn't turning things inside out. He's turning things outside in, welcoming outsiders to become insiders, bringing those in the margins of society to the center of the circle where there are blessings for them and responsibilities for them just like everyone else in Jesus' inner circle of disciples. Jesus brings the leper into a circle. He brings the Roman centurion and his attendant into a circle. He brings an older, sick, widow woman with few options for life into his circle. Jesus draws all of these and many, many more into the circle of his healing love, bringing them to the welcome table where they are accepted, the persons they truly are, beloved children of God. If Jesus has brought you inside the circle of his healing love, listen carefully. Do you hear Jesus saying to you, go and do likewise? Go and do likewise. You see, if you are in the inner circle with Jesus, if you are an insider, if you are following Jesus in faithful discipleship, it becomes your job not to sit comfortably content at center circle, but to actively turn things outside, outside in. Bringing those on the outside into the inside, making the circle bigger and bigger so there's plenty of good room for all. It is your job to make the circle a truly welcoming place for everybody, especially for those who are on the outside, those hanging on the margins of society, those peeking in the windows and doors of the church, wondering if they can come in, if they will be welcome just as they are, wishing for a place, hoping for a place, longing for a place in the circle of the Jesus community. It is your job to make room in the circle for those who have long since walked away from the church, finding no room, no place for them on the inside. So to all of you insiders here today, let's start turning things outside in. Shall we? Will you pray with me? Living Christ, it is very tempting to work our way to center circle whether at work, in the church, in the neighborhood, or in the community, then to sit contentedly with our location, wanting to protect it, preserve it, keep it safe. Living Christ, help us to have the courage and the deep desire to open up the circle, to bring those on the outside in, to push the circle's boundaries, expanding your circle of healing love to include everyone you love, all of God's children. Living Christ, even when the way is lonesome, the valleys deep, the mountains steep and high, may the Spirit empower us to follow you in faithful discipleship in our individual lives and in our communal lives in this community of faith. Amen. <laughs>